Good morning, everyone. Derek from A2K. I hope you all had a great weekend. And thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Fusion 360, the step to 3D printing. So we'll have applications engineer John Pichu presenting for us. We'll first go through about A2K. We're all about fostering innovation through consulting and training. A2K Technologies plays a vital role in helping the infrastructure, building, mining, construction, architecture, and manufacturing industries reach their full potential by delivering complete technology solutions and support services, such as education, consulting, and IT managed services. We're working with visionaries to shape the future of design and in turn enable them to innovation to minimize risks, improve productivity, and achieve excellence. A2K Technologies is considered business partner of choice and trusted advisor by vendors and clients. We partner with major software and hardware vendors to meet the client's technology needs. We strive to exceed client expectations by understanding the challenges and delivering solutions through experience and innovation. We work with clients and companies of any choice nationally and abroad. Over to you, John. Thanks, Dexter. You can hear me okay there? Just a quick sound check. Yep, all good, Don. John, thanks. Very good. Thanks for that introduction, Dexter. And uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us today. It's um, great to have so many people along to uh, to explore some of the functionalities of um, Fusion and 3D printing. So just a couple of things about myself first up. Uh, I'm presently working with A2K as a technology expert slash applications engineer, uh, mainly focused in the mechanical space. I've got about 20 years of uh, history in that space. I started my uh, career as a fitter and turner, fitter machinist, and um, been involved in various aspects of manufacturing. Uh, been, uh, I've spent 10 years or so in hydraulics and pneumatics and uh, a number of years in CNC programming. So I've got a bit of a background in, uh, in the manufacturing sector. But for the past 13 years or so, I've been uh, involved with the Autodesk uh, line of products and the CAD industry. And more recently, I've been focused on uh, additive manufacturing or 3D printing, as we often refer to it. Um, but uh, we're certainly involved in that here at A2K and uh, the line of Autodesk products that uh, marry up with that are very powerful. And we hope to explore some of those uh, functionalities uh, in what we're going to talk about today. So um, just with regard to a bit of an agenda for today, first up, we're going to, like I said, talk a little bit about basic fusion. Uh, I'd like to go into, just to give you a bit of a walkthrough on the interface generally. Uh, we'll just be touching on a number of the aspects, perhaps the key elements, I suppose, with Fusion Interface and uh, some of those areas. Uh, we talk about generative design. Some of you may have come across that uh, terminology in the past. Generative design is a very, very powerful tool that's been included in some of the 3D CAD software packages of late. It's included in your Fusion 360 interface and also within the inventor package, if any of you have had exposure to that. So I'd like to give you a bit of a rundown on how generative design works um, and uh, some of the workflows. And then obviously that leads us into uh, the other key element of today's presentation, which is 3D printing. So I'll be uh, spending a bit of time uh, walking from the, the Fusion interface and into a, a couple of the other uh, what we call slicing software interfaces. Um, one of those is Cura, which is quite a common one. C-U-R-A, Cura is a, a very powerful slicing software, um, which basically generates the pathing for your 3D printing device. Uh, so we can output a 3D model uh, into a, a 3D printed scenario. So we'll look at a couple of those. Uh, another one of those is Iger, which is um, a piece of software that also does a similar job. Uh, and I'll certainly explain those uh, towards the end of our presentation. But first up, just a couple of things with regard to the, the future of making things and, and how we go about manufacture these days. Obviously, um, we're facing uh, some very serious challenges with the way we manufacture items and uh, the way manufacturing is, is happening around the world. Uh, obviously, um, with Industry 4.0, which some of you may have come across in the past, there's, uh, there's a lot of move towards uh, greater technology and uh, greater inclusion of um, certain software elements and uh, aspects of that. But why do we talk about the future of making so much? Well, really the, the concept of um, manufacturing is changing. We need to rethink the way we design things. We need to rethink the way 
we manufacture and the way we uh, create items. The reason for that is we're obviously uh, facing challenges uh, environmentally with the way we currently do things. Um, we're also facing the need to become more efficient with the resources that we've got available. Um, certainly the world has <laughs> so many resources, but um, many of those are a shrinking resource, I guess. So we, we need to just be very cautious and aware of, of how we're using those resources and becoming more efficient with the resources we have available is quite an important part of manufacturing these days. So that's where uh, the likes of fusion and generative design and 3D printing uh, all uh, make a, a major impact in the way that we, um, we're going to be thinking about um, certain things. And I'm certain we'd all be aware over the past few months, especially with the global challenges um, we're facing um, with the COVID pandemic and the like, um, there's a lot of impact on trade and supply and different elements of that. So I guess the, the bottom line is we need to really rethink how we're, we're going about things. And really this is where Fusion, uh, Autodesk Fusion is a, a very powerful tool. It's a, a cloud enabled 3D CAD system that we can use to, uh, to do many, many things. And I'll certainly give you a bit of a, a rundown on that in a moment. We'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the whole Fusion interface. A um, couple of things about Fusion itself, it's a, um, like I said, it's a very powerful piece of software that, uh, that does a range of different things. It has a number of different interfaces where we can uh, either collaborate with, uh, with other people within the cloud, within our community. Um, we can work in a range of different areas of the Fusion interface, whether we want to do some rendering, uh, whether we want to do um, various other elements. So we've got simulation environments, we've got manufacturing for generating CAM tool paths. If you're, uh, if you're into CNC type equipment and you've got some CNC machines there, we can generate CAM tool paths for that. Uh, there's quite a number of different tools we can use within the Fusion interface and I'll certainly explore those with you when we go to our live demo shortly. Just a couple of other things though, with regard to, um, to the, uh, the whole Fusion space. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll jump into the actual software in a moment, but um, just one or two other things with regard to working with uh, greater efficiency, I guess, and uh, improving performance and uh, making, making elements uh, in, a, in a shorter time frame, and uh, certainly working with, um, with some, uh, some more efficient business systems, I guess. So there's, uh, there's some fairly radical changes going on in the way that things are designed and made these days. And uh, obviously every business is going to need to adopt to or adapt to those changes and adopt a lot of these concepts to be able to be proficient moving into the future. So uh, those challenges are being faced by every aspect of manufacturing and uh, really we need to move on and uh, move with those. And we often hear our customers say to us that they're looking for ways to innovate, um, Really, how do we do that with the time that we have available is the real question. And that's where things like generative design uh, play quite an important part in doing that because they allow us to, um, to uh, manufacture componentry with less waste uh, in a shorter time frame and uh, with much greater um, knowledge of that particular component's application in its, uh, in its various uh, industry. So our customers are always looking for better performance. They're looking for ways of understanding uh, how their design will operate before they even start manufacturing it. So uh, we've sort of moved away almost from the whole digital prototype, prototyping world now. And uh, we're moving into a scenario where we need to be much more proficient in that space to, uh, to be able to get products to market quicker. So I guess the big question, are we getting the, uh, the most out of our machines? Are we... Uh, reducing bottlenecks in our processes and that's really what uh, industry 4.0 is leading us to and uh, certainly being able to gain more business and uh, become more proficient in our business is, is quite a critical um, part of the way that uh, that Autodesk has been thinking and generating their software over a number of years now. So how can Autodesk help us with that? Well effectively uh, many of you would have heard of the, uh, the product design manufacturing collection of which Fusion is a part, but uh, the product design manufacturing collection has a, a load of software included with it that, uh, that helps us drive 
those pursuits and uh, certainly we'll be looking and taking a bit more of a, a dive into Fusion in a moment to, uh, to give you a bit of a rundown on the interface and maybe how you can become more proficient in the way that you're manufacturing products in your particular uh, environment. So just like to a uh, couple of slides on generative design, and uh, this is a, a great example of that. Uh, General Motors in the US uh, basically used to create a seatbelt bracket for one of their motor vehicles. Uh, as you can see, the component on the left, it um, uh, was manufactured from a series of metal pressings uh, that were effectively fabricated and uh, welded and spot welded and then bolted together. Uh, so as you can see, the component on the left, there was um, I think there was a total of eight different metal pressings in that particular environment. Um, but uh, if you look at the component on the right, which was uh, will do the same job, um, it has uh, obviously been developed using a generative design tool, which effectively creates for us the, uh, the web structure that you can see there. So it will give us the same strength. Uh, it will give us, um, in actual fact, it's 20% stronger, as you can see there. And the big bonus is that it's 40% lighter. So you can see there with a 3D printed metal component, GM were able to, uh, to create um, the same uh, physical component effectively, uh, where they were previously using eight uh, particular metal pressings. And you can imagine all of the um, elements of that and the required press tooling and processing that would have been uh, the Q&A on each of those components were effectively with 3D printing, we're able to create one component to replace all of those eight components that they were previously using. Now that's just one component, that's just purely a, a seatbelt bracket. So you can imagine what happens if we were to apply this technology to the entire motor vehicle, for instance. Uh, you can imagine how much more efficient we can become and uh, how, much, how much better we can create componentry and reduce supply chain. Uh, and uh, take that to the next level. So very, very proud, powerful tools available to us here in regard to that. Basically, the way the software works is we model up um, or, or give the software the conditions that we need to apply. The software then runs a, a series of cloud-based tests over that uh, particular item and generates a range of different models that we can select from. And uh, we can pick the one that uh, best suits our needs or, or perhaps gives us the optimum performance in that uh, particular situation. So really it's a technology that does the thinking for you, if you like, it's, uh, it's giving us the option to explore numerous iterations and uh, variations on our design to create um, a part that will actually function for us. So uh, obviously then we take that design and we turn that into a 3D printed component, uh, which I'll step you through towards the end of our demonstration today. So what I'd like to do, just um, as, a, as a bit of an example here, I've got a, um, an example, a fairly simple part. I thought it would just start off with something fairly basic. We've got a, a clevis um, that basically attaches a hydraulic ram to the boom arm of an excavator. Um, and uh, actually what I've done, I've uh, gone to, through a bit of a process and I've modeled this up to save a bit of time. Obviously today isn't about learning how to use Fusion as much as just giving you a quick introduction and hopefully inspiring you to, uh, to look further and to perhaps explore this and how you could uh, maybe have some greater wins within your, uh, your design process. So for this particular clevis part that you can see there at the end of the hydraulic ram, um, effectively this would have been made previously from a couple of pieces of bar stock maybe uh, and welded together or perhaps modeled out of a, a complete solid billet. Um, so yeah, effectively um, we would have subtracted a, a quite a portion of material there, which becomes waste effectively. So if you can imagine we bought a block of steel to machine that particular component from, um, you can imagine the amount of waste, but um, and we'll certainly go through uh, some of those elements of reducing waste. So if I was machining this out of a solid billet, I would be using a, a CNC machine um, to do that. And uh, we would use a process that has now been termed subtractive manufacturing because obviously we're getting a block of steel and we're subtracting material away from that block of steel to create our, our finished component. The flip side of that is what we call additive manufacturing, where we actually add the material to create the part, but we only add the right amount of material. We're not actually generating 
uh, near as much waste or using near as much energy to create um, that clevis component moving forward. So I guess that's where 3D printing comes in. And uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, maybe jump into the Fusion software and give you a quick rundown. I've actually pre-modeled up this particular component, but um, if we, uh, so I've flipped over now into the Fusion interface. I assume you can still see my screen quite fine there, Dexter, and see my Fusion screen okay. So um, effectively with Fusion, we've got, uh, it's a very powerful little interface uh, that's got uh, some pretty clever tools. Um, effectively, um, we can solid model in Fusion. Um, the, um, the Fusion interface, like I said, is very easy to learn. It's a very basic sort of a, a user interface, but with some very complex functionality to it. So just perhaps by way of introduction, uh, the, the Fusion interface is a fairly traditional sort of 3D CAD mod modeling system. Um, the big difference is that um, up the top here in the top left, we've got this little, uh, what we commonly refer to as a waffle icon. Um, and uh, basically this opens our data panel. Now the data panel is a, a cloud storage area, if you like. So effectively I'm, um, I'm working on a cloud storage. So these, these particular components here are sitting uh, on a server somewhere located around the world. And effectively, uh, I can access these from whichever machine I'm at. So if I'm sitting in an airport in Singapore or somewhere, not that many of us are doing that these days, but um, we could be accessing these files from wherever we like, regardless of, uh, of our particular scenario. So one or two other key things about the Fusion interface, obviously we've got a, a menu across the top here with a number of tabs for different types of manufacturing. So you can see here, obviously I'm in the design mode. I'll go through some of the other modes shortly, but effectively with each of these modes, we have a, a series of options here. Um, one or two other key things about the user interface within Fusion itself is um, up the top right here, uh, you'll notice it's got my login details. If I click in here, you'll see we've got this preferences area. Now the preferences area of Fusion is, uh, is quite a, a powerful part of Fusion because it's where we can set our Fusion up to, to behave in certain uh, methods, I suppose, and to give us um, so um, uh, all the, the various functionalities and options that we, we might want to use. So uh, this is an area if you're going to learn Fusion that you want to become proficient in uh, and certainly if you were to sit a training course with a2k we would step through this area in quite some detail uh, it certainly is quite an important part of the whole fusion interface without going into too much detail though effectively in here we've got uh, different settings for all of the different environments whether we want to change some settings in the design area in the manufacture area um, we've got a range of different tools here that we can we can set um, and I'll certainly uh, perhaps touch on some of these a little later on as we go through. But uh, yeah, we can set our units of measurement down here. Uh, so we can tell Fusion what, uh, what units of measurement for our engineering calculations we want to use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and all of the various elements of that. So when we create a component like this in Fusion, and um, um, Fusion actually records all the history of that for us. So Effectively, if I was to go back down here on the bottom left of my screen, I've got this area that we call the timeline. The timeline is a, a very important part of Fusion because what it allows me to do is go back and edit any of the features that I've created uh, and make changes to them. The other really clever thing that I can do here is actually step through the, man the, the process that I use to design this part. And just to save a bit of time today, rather than go through and make this part, because it's obviously not the focus of of today's webinar, but um, uh, I figured I'd just step you through quickly how we actually created this particular component. So I started off just with the rectangular block here of, um, of material. Uh, I placed the four holes in the corners, the counterboard or spot faced holes there you can see. Um, then we went through and created a sketch which um, will become evident in a moment. I basically sketched the cylinder up in the top here. Uh, as you can see, just stepping through um, I created this uh, interaction of uh, the material to join the, the base plate, if you like, with the, the cylindrical extrusion. Um, and then we put a hole through that cylinder at the top there. And finally, we just added some chamfers uh, to tidy our part up and remove the sharp edges. 
So really when we create a component infusion, effectively we're doing just that. We're just working through a series of steps to create um, the, uh, the tool, the, the particular component as we go. Now, as I mentioned, Fusion itself has uh, five or six different interfaces. Uh, we've been looking so far at the design interface, which effectively is where we would do all of our 3D modeling and uh, component creation, if you like. We've got a generative design area, and we're going to talk quite a little more about this as we go through, but um, this was the example that I mentioned earlier with the General Motors seatbelt bracket. Uh, it, uh, it generative design is a very, very powerful tool that uh, that only really been around for five or six years, I guess. Uh, it's a fairly young tool in the, the whole 3D CAD scheme of things. We've been 3D modeling now for 20 or 30 years, and obviously as uh, computers become more intelligent, we can use that technology to uh, to create things. So you can see the example there of a little caster wheel and the traditional method of uh, developing that on the left-hand side. Um, on the right-hand side is perhaps how we would 3D print that particular component in today's manufacturing world. So some, uh, some very clever tools. I'll dive into this one a little bit more in a moment. We're going to explore some generative design on our Clevis in a moment when we go through that. We've also got a render tool. So if you want to create a, a realistic rendering for some advertising perhaps for your product, uh, we can go through and add lighting styles and shadowing and effects to, to create uh, some, some very uh, nice looking um, images of our, of our particular component that we're designing. We've also got an animation option where effectively we can explode an assembly and, and pull it apart and perhaps even create a little movie of that assembly going back together and adding notes to it, you know, put some Loctite here or some grease here as you assemble these components. Uh, so really great for creating uh, construction and, and build type information. Uh, so very handy for, uh, for us to be able to use our 3D model directly to, uh, to create um, perhaps a storyboard of information for uh, the people in the workshop that are fitting these components together, or maybe once the component goes out into the field, we can use our animation for a service record, for instance. So we could pop up little notes to say, after a thousand hours of use, uh, don't forget to add some grease to this area, or uh, you know, we, we need to change this particular seal ring after 10,000 hours of use because it will have worn down, and this is the instruction to disassemble your assembly uh, to allow you to change that seal ring. We've also got a simulation area. So this is another very powerful part of Fusion that we're not really gonna uh, talk too much about today, but again, quite linked with what we're talking about with generative design and also our, um, our Fusion interface in that um, if we talk about uh, generative design and, um, uh, sorry, if we talk about simulation, we can obviously do some stress testing. So very, very powerful uh, tools there that do computational FEA on your model. So you can see an example there of a, uh, a mountain bike uh, fork system. And again, we've added loads to that and we can see how the stress is gonna impact given uh, using such and such a grade of aluminium or, or whatever material we've actually used there. Another really important area of fusion is the manufacturing space where we can go in and uh, generate CAM tool pathing. So as I said before, if you've uh, got some CNC equipment and you want to generate tool paths to, uh, to machine a particular component or to do some manufacturing on a component, the Fusion interface has a very, very powerful um, system for doing this. So allowing us to create tool pathing for, uh, for creating various machining functions in our, um, in our particular environment. And lastly, we've got a drawing environment. Obviously, we can create 2D drawings very quickly from, from Fusion. And effectively, if I was to quickly jump in here, and I'll just do a quick five minute demonstration on this. Effectively, what Fusion will do is allow me to create a drawing of my component tree. Uh, I can pick there the different size piece of paper that I want, etc., And uh, we can go through and generate a drawing very, very quickly. Um, and and um, so here's my drawing and I can just simply place my views of my drawing onto the Fusion interface here and uh, we can place those drawing views as needed. So very quick and easy to create um, 
as you can see, we can go and generate views very quickly um, and then dimension those views. Oops, I'll pop one over the top of this one. Let's not do that. Here would be a better option. Oh, okay, so uh, yeah, very, very quickly creating uh, various views within your um, Fusion environment, very uh, yeah, options to uh, obviously shade these views and do some nice things. Adding dimensions is very, very easy. Um, we do have tools to do that automatically as well. So we can go in here and pick up from any range of dimension that we would like to use. Uh, very, very easy to create dimensions off uh, however we would like to there. So um, yeah, very, very powerful tool for creating um, 2D uh, dimensioning, etc., and uh, working with your um, with your tools. So obviously, Fusion has a range of different uh, hotkeys that we can use as well. So very quickly, able to create, um, yeah, like I said, dimensions and uh, elements there with regard to building our model uh, as we do. But we're not going to focus too much on that. Obviously, this is to convey a message back to our to our drafting environment uh, of our particular uh, to our workshop rather of our, um, our 3D model. So once we've got the 3D model, creating the 2D drawing is, is quite simple just by switching into the drawing area and uh, creating a drawing of our 3D object. But the area that I want to really explore today first up is generative design. So in this particular space here, if we switch to the generative design area, what we do is we set up a study effectively where we uh, tell Fusion that we're going to bolt down on these four holes. So we're going to put a, a pin constraint effectively on these surfaces here and on these holes. Uh, we then add a load. Uh, so this yellow arrow represents the, uh, the, um, uh, the gravity, the, the center of gravity, if you like, or the, uh, the gravitational force of this particular part. But once I've pinned these four holes down, so we, um, we can create conditions here, our design conditions and our structural constraints, etc. And then we can apply a load. So what I've actually done here is applied a bearing load of 5,000 Newton meters to this particular surface here to indicate that when we uh, obviously uh, use our hydraulic ram, we're going to be pulling against these four bolt holes and drawing effectively this uh, particular hold down, uh, this, this uh, section through the center here we would be using uh, 500 Newton meters to create a force there. And effectively what we do is we run that study. So what Fusion does then is actually, when we, uh, and I won't run this at the moment, it'll take a little while and probably uh, interrupt my Zoom session. Uh, so I've got a couple of quick screen captures of what actually happens when I select to run the study or to generate the study here. So once we've assigned these different uh, load and uh, constraint options, Effectively, we, uh, we run the study and then Fusion will come back to us and um, effectively present. Uh, so we set up the study like this. So effectively, the red areas are constrained or, uh, or locations that uh, can't be interfered with, if you like. Um, the green areas would represent uh, some uh, areas of um, interaction between the model. But when we run that study, effectively what Fusion does, it will generate for us a whole range of options that we can choose from. Um, and within that study, we tell Fusion that we want to reduce the weight primarily by X amount. So with this particular study, in actual fact, um, just back in the Fusion interface there, I'll quickly show you. So this particular part here, um, if I was to go back to the design area, um, in here, you'll notice we can pick up the actual weight of the part, and you'll notice here it's uh, um, one and a half kilos, effectively, is the, the, the mass of our particular part. Uh, we've got a whole range of other properties in here as well, and this is something that's uh, obviously very powerful, if you know anything about engineering, to be able to pick all this data from your 3D model. Uh, we can certainly pick up there the mass of our part, etc. So what I did with this particular study was told it that I wanted to reduce the rate, the, the weight of the part by roughly 50%, preferably more if I could, and achieve the same strength. So if I was uh, 
bolted down with these four holes and then I put my 5,000 Newton meters at this particular bore um, area here, what would happen to my model? Well, effectively, Fusion goes away and, and does some calculations and it will, um, it will come back, like I said, with this range of iterations that all comply with my parameters that I've set. So effectively, it would uh, would come back and say, okay, uh, if you want to reduce the weight by 50%, and you would also like to retain the strength rating of that, here's a whole bunch of designs um, that you could use to, uh, to, to create that particular part. So what I would do then is go and select one of these designs. So in actual fact, we selected this one here, only because it, uh, it sort of looked quite appropriate, and we didn't want something that looked too outrageous or was going to be uh, uh, yeah, uh, in this sort of scenario or we didn't want anything that was, uh, was too obscure for whatever reason. Uh, so this particular model here, and as you can see, we've reduced a lot of weight here in the actual modeling process here. So the, the computational results of generative design um, has actually allowed us to, to do that. So basically what we do then is uh, inside the fusion interface, we can, uh, we can see here, here's the, um, the outcome that I achieved. So here's the actual component that, uh, that the fusion generated effectively based on that. So what, what my, uh, my fusion is telling me is that this particular model will be exactly as strong as this particular part. Okay, so we've, we've not uh, compromised our strength uh, but we've reduced the weight by, um, and in actual fact, I don't think this will give me a weight because this is just a surface model at this point. But effectively, um, I'll go into another piece of software in a moment, and you'll see that the weight came down to 600 grams. So we nearly, um, uh, this particular part is a third of the weight of our, um, our original clevis. So we've reduced quite markedly the, uh, the weight of the clevis. Um, now, obviously, I could machine this part on a CNC machine still. Obviously, anybody that's got any experience with CNCs would know that to machine this particular part would take a lot longer than machining the other part. So that's where 3D printing becomes uh, so much more of a technology that we can explore in today's world. And what I'd like to do now is move into that particular space. And uh, Fusion has a direct interface to that. So... When we go to um, our particular component here, and again, you might remember earlier, we talked about all of these options, but when we're in the design space, up the top here, we've got the option for solid modeling. So if I'm gonna model some solid componentry, um, we can go into that particular area. Over here, we've got options for surface modeling. Okay, so for those of you that have done surface modeling before, you might recognize some of these tools. We've got the option for freeform modeling as well, which is sort of a, a push and pull type scenario where effectively we can start off with a, um, a particular shape and then effectively uh, we use what we call teased lines and we can, we can push and pull our model to create um, uh, the various shape that we need to create. So quite a lot of options in the, in the modeling space within Fusion. The other option is mesh. So if you're working with the likes of STL files, for those of you that are familiar with, uh, with STL, uh, we can certainly work with mesh files as well. Some of you may have come across a product called Mesh Mixer. Um, very similar tools available here in the, uh, the Fusion interface. We've also got a sheet metal area in Fusion where we can generate flat patterns. So if you've got a, uh, a particular sheet metal geometry, um, or a sheet metal component that you want to create a flat pattern ready to go into a press or a, um, a laser cut type scenario, we can export out of here as a, um, a DXF file. So we can take that into a, a laser cut or a water jet machine or whatever uh, type of process you're using for that. So Fusion has an amazing amount of tools um, that, uh, that are available to us. And lastly over here, we've got a little menu called tools. And uh, that's the one that I really want to talk about now because Effectively, what we can do with the tools area is you'll notice up here, we've got an area to go into the 3D print side of things. Now, obviously, if, um, if, if we do this, uh, Fusion comes up with an option and says, well, tell me which component you want to 3D print. I can select my STL file here. Now, this is quite clever because in actual fact, what it does, it goes through and it says, well, do you want to send this off to a, a third party utility? Okay, And in this little drop down here, 
Uh, Fusion says to me, well, you've uh, previously used a number of these. Um, I've got a couple of options here. Cura, like I mentioned before, is the common one. Uh, that's very widely used by quite a range of 3D printing devices. Um, I've got a couple of others here as well. So we could go into Preform, which is another tool that we use for a different um, brand of printer. So a, um, a printer that uh, prints in resin is, a, is another type of printer that uses this Preform application. I'll jump into those in a moment, but um, certainly uh, we've got the option here to do that. So if we were to pick OK here, what would happen is Fusion would go off and fire up my, my Cura interface, um, which is what I've got here. So effectively, this particular model now is, um, is inside uh, the Cura interface, and I've got this attached to a, another printing device, which, um, which A2K is dealing, but um, effectively, uh, what we've got here is the option now to go and explore how we'd like to print this particular component. Now, this particular 3D printer is, is printing in a, uh, I can select materials from a range of different plastics, obviously, um, but uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of other tools that we've got with regard to that. So what this, uh, this particular software does is it actually now slices my part to show me uh, how we're actually going to go through that uh, that printing sequence with uh, with working with our um, our model. So most of these interfaces are quite simple to use. Um, for those of you that have tinkered with Cura before, we uh, we select the part, we can rotate the part, we can print it in a different orientation, we can revolve it around, we can pick uh, however we would like to set it up to print. Um, effectively, the software here, this particular Cura software will actually generate supports and things like that. So over here, I've got a, another interface. So bear in mind that Fusion has linked me directly with this. So uh, Fusion is actually the uh, getting me to this point where I can very quickly go in and slice my model. Now, within Cura, there's uh, <laughs> thousands of options. Anybody that knows anything about 3D printing, this is actually an open source type 3D printing software, which effectively then allows me to take my model into a production environment. Um, and we can go in here and tell Fusion that we want to do certain things. I've got a number of options already selected here. Um, and if I jump over into this preview area, you'll notice that what Fusion does, it, uh, it wants me to slice the part, which generates the layers um, for my particular component there. So this will go off and slice the part and uh, process the layers as we would, um, as you can now see. So it's set up a range of uh, aspects for supporting the plastic as it prints. So you can see I've got a brim here to help my parts stick to the table nicely. Uh, these little sections, vertical sections here are to support the molten plastic as we print it. And yeah, the really cool thing I can do here is actually work my way down through the part to see each layer. And as you can see there, this is very clever in that it's done a triangulated infill to save material again. So effectively, my component is actually completely hollow, um, apart from this triangulated infill section here. So yeah, we've basically taken a fairly basic part here. Uh, like I said, I've shown you that we can reduce the weight by um, uh, nearly 70%. So, um, so yeah, quite a, a big saving there. And now we can create that component. Now, admittedly, this is only printing in plastic. But um, we certainly have the option, obviously, to take that same file into other slicing software. And one of the other ones that I'd like to just give you a quick rundown on is called Iger. So this is another web-based application, um, which uh, A2K um, use, and uh, we, we can generate that same particular part um, using a, a range of different steels. So these particular printers that I'm talking about here have the capacity not only to print in nylon or, um, or various plastics, but also we can print in stainless steel. And uh, A2K actually do have one of these printers set up uh, in one of our facilities in Adelaide. And uh, we're able to print this part in 17.4 stainless steel. Uh, we can print it in Inconel, for those of you that are aware of uh, tool steels. Um, there's a couple of other tool steels as well. We can print it in H13. Uh, D2 and A2 tool steel as well. So basically this software is very similar to the Cura application. 
in the sense that uh, if I was to go over to this particular part of the interface, effectively this generates now the slicing aspect, if you like, to, uh, to enable me to, um, to slice my software, and, uh, to slice my component and generate the, the layers. So again, if I jump in here, you'll notice I can see the layers of stainless steel or, uh, or tool steel or uh, whatever I've used to select this. So you can see here along the bottom, we have this, uh, this option to, uh, to see how our component would be created. Um, and uh, we can watch those layers um, get built, etc. So we did actually do this as a bit of a, a test sample. And uh, on the next slide here, I've actually got an example of that particular part. So basically here's our original model uh, that we started off with, our, our basic Clevis. We ran it through the generative design software and effectively we created this particular shape and then we 3D printed that. So here's the actual physical part that's printed in 17 Ford stainless steel. And uh, as you can see there, we've printed this. It's a very much a layering type technology, but um, effectively this particular part is, uh, holds the same strength as this part, but it weighs uh, just over a third of the weight. So you can see the difference here. This is how we would make something uh, going back 10, 20 years ago, I suppose. Um, but this is the way of the future. This is how we could create a 3D model and take it into an environment where now, um, now obviously I'm using the example of an excavator. You can imagine if you put this on the excavator, it mightn't sound a lot to save a kilo here and there, but you might have 10 of these clevises on your excavator. All of a sudden you've got 10 less kilos that you have to pick up every time. That means I can pick up 10 kilos uh, more product. And obviously the greater we go in size, obviously the greater the saving. So yeah, like I said, uh, lots of different options there for, for doing that. So I've actually got this physical part of my desk at the moment, which we printed out in stainless steel. And yes, like I said, it's a completely hollow part as well. So it's got a triangulated infill. Um, and the only way we could have done this is using a generative design tool, which Autodesk have within their Fusion software and also their Inventor software, um, which allows us to explore some of these other design iterations and uh, various other elements of manufacturing and, and various processing. So one other little example I'd like to just show you by way of a couple of slides. So um, hopefully that little example has uh, given you a bit of an idea of, of how we go about this. It's, uh, it's not rocket science, it's very, quite a, a simple process to go through where basically the software gives you a range of different options for setting up your model and taking it through to, uh, to each of those um, various areas of 3D design. So another little example I've got here is uh, the swing arm of a motorbike. Um, so you can see an example there um, on your screen, hopefully of a, um, of a motorbike. And effectively what we've got here is we set up some areas of attachment. So the green areas represent where we're actually gonna attach the, the swing arm to our motorbike. The red areas are areas where the swing arm can't in intersect. So effectively it will preserve that region and, uh, and work through from that. Um, effectively what we do then is we run this through a, a process or so run it through a piece of software. Um, and here's a couple of examples, apologies for the grainy image there, but effectively in the top left or the top right, you can see a range of different examples of how we might create that swing arm. So again, a swing arm in, in history would have been uh, fabricated together using aluminium box section or, or a, uh, perhaps a, a couple of components that are, that are manufactured. But nowadays we've got opportunity to use this generative design tool, which uh, obviously then will explore all the limits of a whole range of different configurations of that. And we can set up a range of filters here as well. So as you can see in the chart in the middle there, we can set up filters to come up with perhaps um, a number of different design options. Um, but again, we, we also include the load ratings on that. So if there's so many Newton meters of force on the center axle of that particular um, assembly, then we need to apply that to, uh, to our particular situation. So um, yeah, basically, um, 
the uh, moving on to the next slide here. So here's an example of of that swing arm in place. Again, looks uh, quite futuristic, obviously, but um, uh, so effectively that uh, that particular swing arm, if we were to use that iteration, it'll give us the strength, the stiffness, the mass, as you can see in the bottom left there. It'll tell us a whole range of engineering calculations about the heat flux and uh, even down to things like the manufacturing time. And this software is actually clever enough then to say, well, I can go off and get a quote from a couple of different companies around the world. And here's some companies that do this sort of processing. So, uh, so there's a company in Sydney, according to our little map there in the bottom right, that would actually be able to 3D print this part for you. So, um, so very, very clever technology. And in actual fact, I'll just jump back into the fusion space because in the fusion space up here, we've got an option to get uh, from a couple of sponsored companies. So you can see here, there's three companies listed where I could actually go and get a quote to print this particular part for me either via a company here called Proto Labs. Uh, we've got an option called 100K Garages and also another one here uh, where we could go and get the parts made uh, or manufactured uh, by suppliers around the world. So, so yeah, quite clever that we can, uh, we can link in with, uh, with a whole range of manufacturing processes um, and, uh, and do that. So, so yeah, very, very powerful tools to be able to, uh, to take us through from conceptualizing something and then doing the the, uh, the the more complex element of that, which is com computational generation of that particular component using what we call this generative design modeling technique, where effectively, as you can see, it's going to uh, miss all the, uh, the components that are moving parts there, but also it's, uh, it's going to allow us to, uh, to do that. So yeah, quite a clever bunch of technologies. Here's the, uh, the actual part being put through on a 3D printer, and uh, there's the, uh, the layering form for that. That's quite a, a grainy image, but um, again, if we wanted to post-process and, and re-machine that, um, we can certainly do that. So yeah, quite a, uh, a powerful bunch of tools, and, and look, I guess the, certainly not a, an in-depth look today at that. We don't have the time to go through um, searching out and looking through all of those options, but I hope what we've covered today is sort of uh, inspired you to look a little further at, uh, at some of the, uh, the options we've got available to us. Basically, the, um, the Fusion interface is a very powerful interface. Uh, we've got a whole range of tools available to us where we can explore uh, these generative design iterations of our model um, and uh, go through and use those uh, for, for the benefit of our production and, and making our, our products more efficiently uh, with less waste uh, as we all know, the, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of our webinar, the resources that we have available to us are, are limited. So being able to do things with, uh, with less of an impact to the environment, I guess, primarily, but also to do these sorts of things with, um, with greater efficiency, shorter lead times. So obviously to, uh, to 3D print a part of that nature, um, yeah, we, we can certainly uh, achieve that. So. Uh, this is sort of the way of the future, I guess. And uh, I guess, like I said, I, I hope what we've covered today uh, inspires you to look further at that. So um, so with that, uh, thanks for your attention. It's uh, been good to have you along today. And